Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome back to the meeting. Uh, this morning we're, we're going to have a couple of sessions on uh, feedback from black holes in the centers of galaxy clusters. Uh, so to give our keynote uh, address, Christine Jones will talk about interactions between supermassive black holes and hot atmospheres in early type galaxies, groups, and clusters. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming after a fairly uh, late but a very enjoyable night last night. Um, do I have a microphone here to put on? Okay. I'm supposed to wear this. How does this work? Are we good? Okay. I'll be fine. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, feedback in both rich clusters, groups of galaxies, and, and individual galaxies. I feel like I'm incredibly loud. I'm not? Okay, wow. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm trying to talk softer and softer. Uh, so I'm not going to be talking about M87, but later this morning, Bill Foreman's going to give an entire talk just on M87. So view this talk as putting M87 into the context of cooling core clusters. So I'm going to start off by telling you how much, or you might think of it as how little, um, you know, we knew about feedback and things um, before Chandra and XMM. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information on on the history of X-ray astronomy. I know most of you guys are, are maybe you are radio astronomers. Let me tell you a little bit about how we learned about clusters and things. Um, so let me tell you about, this will tell you about the galaxies and then a little bit about the, the clusters. And then most of the talk um, is about the AGN feedback in these systems. And these are all of the many people who contributed um, to this talk. So, before 1980, um, people didn't really realize that most of the baryonic material in clusters of galaxies was the hot gas. Um, so this is uh, the first evidence from Uhuru, which was a scanning X-ray uh, mission, of, of where the X-ray gas was distributed in, the, in the, the Perseus cluster, basically here around uh, um, NGC 1275. So we now know that the, 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 this ISM is about five times the stellar mass, and it's really most of the, um, the um, baryonic material with, again, the majority of the non-baryonic material being the dark matter. Um, the, this hot gas was also found from early instruments, Ariel 5 and Oso 8, um, to have iron in its, in its spectrum. And here are three clusters. And what I wrote here is the mass of the heavy elements in the hot ISM is more than that in all the stars in all the cluster galaxies. So all of this iron has come out of the galaxies and, and gone into the um, ISM. Okay, we knew um, a little bit even early, um, discovered from by the Copernicus observations about cluster cooling cores. And this was an, a, a paper by um, Andy Fabian and Paul Nelson on um, subsonic accretion of, of cooling gas in clusters of galaxies. And this was what um, the Einstein IPC observation of Perseus looked like. You couldn't see any structure in the IPC. Um, but you could see that it was round and you knew the center was, was dense and had to be cooling. At that time, cooling flows were estimated up to, to be up to thousands of solar masses a year. Um, but the problem was that nobody was seeing where all of this cool gas was going. So that was really what people have been referring to as the cooling flow problem. Okay. Um, the other thing we learned about clusters early on was that they used to be thought of as nice, uh, fully evolved, relaxed systems. And in fact, most of them weren't. Uh, but they were either undergoing mergers or about to undergo mergers. They were just simply not relaxed. Um, so um, there were two very classic papers um, in the 1970s. Um, 
saying that elliptical galaxies were gas-free systems. And, and there are people who still sometimes refer to elliptical galaxies as being gas-free. And it's true, they don't have a lot of cold gas in them, um, but the massive ones have a lot of hot gas associated with them. And the one paper was by Matthews and Baker here, uh, why, and it was titled, Why Do Most Elliptical Galaxies Show No Evidence of Interstellar Matter? Okay, because you haven't looked in the hot, <laughs> you haven't looked in the x-rays. Um, so they assumed that the, the, the supernovae were driving galactic winds that would be completely undetectable by any direct observation with this low luminosity. Okay? They're really easy to detect. They're really x-ray bright. Not a problem. And another paper in 1976 um, that calculated the stellar mass loss and said, okay, in a big elliptical, like in Virgo, the real BCG of that cluster, 4472, you'd have detectable H1 after just 10 to the 8th years. There was no known feedback mechanism to prevent star formation. So, you know, this was kind of another problem, and there was no gas in these systems. Well, these views started to change really pretty slowly um, following the first Einstein observations that showed that really all massive elliptical galaxies were gas-rich. Um, and these were a couple of the ones that that uh, Bill looked like in this paper on Virgo ellipticals. Here's M86, uh, really a, more of a group than a galaxy falling into the Virgo cluster. And the contours here show the very extended gas around them. Here's 4472 um, in, the, in the south of Virgo. And again, the contours show the hot extended 1 keV temperature x-ray gas. Um, there were studies done of individual uh, galaxies. This is a Chandra observation of one of those. And you can see there's this hot gas around the galaxy, and these were examples. Um, we did a survey a long time ago, and this is the blue magnitude, and here's the X-ray luminosity, and you can basically see these are all systems that have a lot of hot gas in them. And basically, that, that hot gas is really universal in the massive ellipticals. There was also very early evidence um, for AGM feedback. Um, this is a, a, a ROSAT HRI image of the center of the Perseus cluster that Hans Boringer made. And um, Eugene showed, using these, these ROSAT observations, um, that the energy from the AGN, as measured by looking at the size of the bubbles they created, um, equaled the energy that was lost to gas cooling. So this cooling flow problem uh, was already beginning to be solved. Now we have, you know, Chandra observations that shows AGN feedback is really common in many of the early type galaxies, groups, and clusters. Um, XMM, um, RGS spectra, um, early on showed that there was no emission lines from the cooling gas. Again, saying there's no cooling gas, the gas is being reheated, the AGN are doing that. And so we know now that this usually truncates star formation in ellipticals and keeps red galaxies red. Okay, so just to show you clearly um, how much or how little um, most of us knew about jets and clusters um, before Chandra and XMM, um, when we were planning the first uh, Chandra observations, I was just talking to Brian McNamara, who was working with us at that time. Um, a lot of the, the observations, some were, were not so interesting calibration observations, um, and other ones had been picked by the instrument teams or by the interdisciplinary scientists, and all that data would be proprietary for a year. So there was a, a goal to make some Chandra observations, pick some, and, and make them public so that people could learn to analyze Chandra observations. So you might think now you've got really you know, good teams and you've got really smart interdisciplinary scientists. You know, a lot of the good projects, I mean, they're already going to be scooped up by people. And some were, but you know, there were other ones that weren't. Um, so um, we selected CENA as we knew it had from an X-ray jet um, from Einstein. And we also picked Hydra A. That was one of Bryant's favorites. 
um, because we knew from Einstein and Rosette that it was a nice round cool core cluster and had a lot of radio emission associated with the core. Um, so you may be surprised that these two objects uh, weren't in anybody's plans already. It just shows you really how little we tended to know about uh, um, feedback and AGN and cooling flows. So of course Chandra showed much more on these. Um, here's a beautiful, you know, Sene observation. This is a much deeper one than the, the first one we were able to squeeze in at the beginning. But even the first one, you know, showed a lot of this, the, the bubble here and, and, and of course the jet and some of the structure shown here. And you know, as, as Brian has already you know, talked about, um, this shows the, uh, the nice cavities here um, in the Hydra A cluster filled with radio emission. So this really, you know, especially in the area of AGN feedback, Chandra's really revolutionized um, what we knew. You should also know that kind of since this was sort of when this started as a big thing, it's really a pretty young field. I mean, it's only, you know, I mean, Chandra was launched about 16 years ago, and this is really when people got really interested in this. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do today um, is show you a few examples of, um, of you know, rich, massive clusters um, where there's AGN feedback going on, um, a few groups, I have quite a few groups, I like groups a lot, um, and, and a few uh, galaxy systems. And you can see from these, this just sort, sort of shows you generally, when you see these, um, this kind of structure, you've got cavities in the gas. And this kind of gives you the size of those cavities that you, here are small ones, here are big ones, um, here are really big ones, and, and how much energy is involved in, in making those cavities. So I'm going to start first with clusters, okay? This is a, a nice picture of N87, and other than to tell you that Bill's going to tell you a whole lot more about it um, in a talk later this morning, um, I'm not going to say much about it. Um, here's, here's Perseus, and Andy Fabian's written, I'm not sure I've gotten all of his papers on it, uh, but he's written quite a few papers um, on the Perseus cluster. Um, Eugene's going to show you more in his talk. Um, but I'll show you some of the, the primary things going on. You can already see from, from this image, here's the core. Okay. These are two of the inner cavities. Um, there's an outer cavity that's easy to see here that get made by the, by the gas. All this filamentary stuff, um, that's absorption by a, a, a galaxy that, that came in and it's being been stripped off gas from it. It doesn't have anything to do with the um, feedback for the outburst. Okay. So what we do in these systems um, is we, we measure the sizes of, of cavities. Um, sometimes we also can measure the energy that's in, in the shocks. Um, we assume that the cavities are in pressure balance with the ICM, and then we can measure the total amount of energy um, that it took to inflate those cavities. And that gives us the mechanical work. So between the, the, the the shocks and the bubbles, um, we can estimate the amount of energy um, that comes out of the, uh, from the AGN. We can also measure how far the cavities are from the AGN. These two are close, um, this one's further, and we can, they're mostly pretty rising pretty gently, so we just take the, the buoyancy rise time, and that gives us the age of the cavities. Um, so we can tell when the outburst happened um, and kind of estimate what the long-term um, um, energy output from the AGN is. Okay, so I'm going to I pick two examples of clusters. Um, you have to pick Perseus because it's the nearest, it's the brightest, it's the most spectacular. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about Perseus. And then I'm going to talk to you about another cluster. It's called the Phoenix Cluster. And Mike McDonald has been leading the work on that. Um, I, I'm, it's very hard to see. It has two tiny cavities right here and here in the centers. If I make the pictures so that you can see the cavities, then you can't see the extended emission. So trust me, there are two tiny cavities. These also, as well as, as 
um, all of the cooling core clusters, they've got short cooling times in their cores. Okay, so going back again a bit, um, here's the, this HRI observation um, that, that showed for Perseus what was here. And um, Eugene's, sorry, uh, Eugene's paper on this is you know, what, what measured um, from 2000, measured how much um, energy there was in, in this kind of structure and made a first estimate of, of how the whole AGN feedback could work. Um, so we now know there's been deep, deep observations. This is just the same X-ray image of Perseus, um, different color scheme this time. So you can see the, the, the bubbles here, the stripped gas, here's this nice outer bubble. Um, and these really showed um, that supermassive black holes um, start growing rapidly. Um, they are radiatively bright early on. That's when we call them quasars. Um, but at this time in their lives, they're very faint radiatively, but they're very powerful mechanically. And it's through this feedback mechanism that they suppress you know, all the, the gas cooling going on. And these were a couple of the, the very early you know, fundamental papers um, done at this time. Okay. So here's Perseus again. And this is from um, Andy Fabian's annual reviews, but also published in other papers as well. And this one here is this core region here, the, the same bubble region here, but this one's a pressure map. So this gas here is, is highly overpressured um, compared to the gas around. And here he, he's um, done, an, it's called an unsharp masked image. Okay, he's, he's smoothed it and then he subtracted it and divided by things. And you can see ripples here in the gas. Here's the, that central bubble region, but here are these ripples, or he, he calls them sound waves. And these may be what transports much of the energy that's coming out you know, from the AGN, first into the bubbles, but then also into the ripples, out to heating the, the hot gas um, in the cores. Okay. Um, so there is our spectacular um, H-alpha filaments also here, and these are at about the same scale. Um, so what you see here is there's a nice horseshoe-shaped one here, and that may have been one that's been dragged up by this bubble. These are all cool gas, you know, dragged up from the core uh, by these rising bubbles um, that cause these, these filaments. And, you know, they're probably stabilized by magnetic fields. So, in addition to this being a really spectacular picture, um, Andy told me that he had to propose um, not once to the um, HST TAC to try to get an H-alpha image, not twice, not three times, I think he told me seven times. So, for all of you who've had proposals turned down, Remember this one <laughs> and keep trying. If, you, if it's really as, going to be as interesting, it's, it's worth trying again. Okay. So the, here's Perseus again. All right. And most of the time you have, you have a central AGN, it has this, these bubbles, it has shocks, and it reheats the gas in the cooling core. And we see that in many, many clusters. But occasionally, feedback isn't working right. Most of the time, it's fine. But sometimes feedback and cooling aren't balanced. And this you know, Phoenix cluster here, um, which was selected from the, the South Pole Telescope SZ sample, this is its phone number name, um, is one of those. Okay? Um, the colors here are just their x-rays, so we can make them up any way we want. Um, but here's the optical. So whereas most galaxies at the center of the clusters, the BCGs, are red, this one is blue. There's a huge amount of star formation going on in this cluster. And feedback and cooling are definitely not balanced. Okay, so here's again a picture. And this is the, the x-ray. Here's this other one. 
Again, it's got tiny cavities here in the core. There's one on each side. And those are, are again, where, the, um, where the, 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 the feedback is going on. Um, this is the feedback, the average star form rate over time is about 610 plus or minus 50 solar masses a year. It's a huge amount. And if you look at, um, again, here, here it is. You know, here's the luminosity. Um, it's really the most luminous cluster known. And it's at a redshift of 0.6. This is its cooling flow number. I told you the average kind of feedback, the, the, the star formation rate's about you know, 600 or so. So a fraction of this is going into stars, but you know, we usually tend to overestimate that one by a bit. Um, another table that I know you can't read, um, what I wanted you to see is there are estimates in here of the star formation uh, rates, which go from um, you know, 400 to 1600 based on the IR. Okay. They're very high. It's just not the kind of star formation that you see in a typical cluster BCG. Okay. It's actually 30% of the classical cooling rate. And the classical rate means there's been no feedback applied to it. Um, this is easily the highest star formation rate seen um, in a BCG. So here, for the Phoenix, feedback does not reheat the cooling and does not truncate star formation. This is the um, HST image um, that Mike got from Director's Discretionary Time, a UV uh, optical image of the cluster. And this is it blown up again. Um, and this does not look like a standard red ECG. Um, it just simply isn't the kind of galaxy you see at the centers of clusters. Um, and it's basically, you don't have enough AGN feedback going on in this system to balance the cooling. Okay. So now I wanted to talk to you a bit about, about groups of galaxies. Um, and this is a particularly pretty one. Um, that Scott Randall's led the work on. And I wasn't sure which ones would show up better, and I can see them clearly on my computer, but um, there's a central core here where there are, are very small bursts, uh, two cavities, one here, one here. So this is, um, has about a Mach number because it has shocks on the edges so we can measure how fast it's expanding of 1.7. Um, it's only about 3 million years since this outburst happened, and here's the power contained in that. Um, there's a middle set of, of ones that you can see here on this one. Uh, the, the, the cavities are here. Um, the shocks associated with these edges are here. Um, so we can measure these are about 20 million years old and have 10 times more power in them. Um, there's actually, there's an outer cavity here um, and a faint one here, and you know more emission you know out here, and this one's about 90 million years since the outburst started, and about comparable amount of energy to what's seen in the, the inner ones. Um, this first one may be lower; it could still be um, going on at this point. And the nucleus, where you think all the emission should be, is tiny. Here's the amount of luminosity from the nucleus. They are radiatively faint, um, and that shows how radiatively faint they are. Okay. Here's a, another really nice group that Liz Blanton has worked on. Um, here's what the x-ray looks like. This x-ray is here. It's been, um, we usually put x-ray contours on an optical image. Um, here she's put the optical contours on the x-ray image. So this is the central galaxy, and most of these are just whatever sources there is another galaxy here. So here you see not quite as nicely structured um, a set of, of cavities as you saw in 5813. Um, there's a nice shock that's labeled here, and it's labeled here as the shock, possibly a second shock. And from this shock, um, um, you, can, you can measure the, the, the shock and the density jump and the temperature jump, and you can get this Mach number. A pretty mild outburst happening here. 
Um, this is another galaxy that was observed with Chandra, and Akos Bowden has written a paper on this. And if you look, here's the scale. This is an arc minute, is that big? And that's at the distance of this galaxy, 18.2 kiloparsecs. And what you, you see when you look at it, this is the Chandra observation. There's the nucleus, okay? And it looks kind of like there's a big ring of emission out here. Um, you know, the size, here's, here's, here's 18, so, you know, it's about 40 kiloparsecs across. It's, it looks like a huge cavity. Um, when we looked at it a bit more and, and decided it was probably two cavities, one here, one here, and that would be one here and one here. And you can figure out that this, um, this, this cavity here that uh, produced produce this um, is a, was it happened about 80 million years ago and it took about 10 to the 58 herbs to move the gas you know out of these cavities here's the radio the nice VLA here um, this is and these everybody's at the same scale the contours here are the radio emission from the the GMRT and you can see they expand somewhat beyond this. And it looks like there is one more outer cavity in this region here that we can see um, in the x-rays. And what we expect happened is that there was a second outburst um, that's younger, um, only you know, 15 to 30 million years ago, but it was a lot more powerful uh, by a factor of a few, of a, well, one and a half maybe, than the first one. Um, and it kind of overran the, the first set of cavities that were produced um, and much more uniformly heating the core of this, um, this group. Okay, I have one more group I think to show you. And this is NGC 5044, uh, which Larry David's worked on. Here's the nice bright BCG in this. It's a very bright galaxy. And here's the x-rays. And what I want you to kind of be able to see is that there are a lot of little cavities. This is not smooth. There are, there are filaments here. Um, there's a, a, a cold front you know, up in here. Um, there's a lot going on. It, it's not the nice ordered, let's have a, a, a big outburst to make a couple of big cavities. Um, this one is much more that it's been burbling along, making a lot more you know, smaller cavities that do a perfectly fine job of, of heating the, the, the roof gas, um, but it's, it's different from the other ones. So groups come in a lot of different kinds um, and ways of, of having the feedback work. Um, I wanted to just summarize a little bit on the, the, the cavities and groups and clusters by showing this view um, a bit of this nice work uh, by, by Panagolia. And she looked at 101 clusters and groups, and she found 30 that had cavities. Um, that, and she, what she found is that all the ones with cavities have central cooling times less than 3 million years. Um, and this shows that distribution for the clusters and the distribution for the groups. And the ones that had cavities are the ones in blue. Okay. So she found cavities in 80% of these cool core clusters and groups. There were other ones um, in her sample. I mean, these are the ones that have the cavities. There are other ones in here that have longer cooling times. Those don't have cavities. Um, she also looked at some of the cavity selection effects. Um, and this just basically tells you how many you know, x-ray counts did you get within the, the core, the, the, the central 20 kiloparsecs of the, the cluster. And, and this is the, the, the cooling time. And when you don't have a lot of counts, um, it's really hard to see cavities. And when you do have counts, these are all the red ones. Then you can pick them out. So um, many of these other ones, if you look longer, I'm willing to bet they've got cavities but we do struggle with that. Now I wanted to talk to you um, a bit about elliptical galaxies. And they have 
um, several components to them. They've got the hot gas that's in them. And what's plotted here is this is the hot gas for M87. Okay? The much more typical ones that we're looking at here, um, this is uh, the other Virgo bright one, NGC 4472. Here's its hot gas here. Um, they have X-ray binaries in them. Um, which when you use deep chandra observations, um, you can see them down to some level. There are background in this system, and this is, this is what, uh, what the, the binary spectra provides. So you've got to take those out. And then there are the ones you can't resolve at all um, in galaxies, and that's the stars. Okay. There was a very deep observation that Mike Revenzev did of the galactic ridge with Chandra, and he did show that the, that ridge emission um, could be resolved into stars. So we know that, uh, I'll show you a lot of these have low luminosity AGN in them, um, as well as hot gas. Okay. So this is some um, early results from a survey that we're doing now with Mike Anderson um, and Eugene Chirotsov. And here is a function of absolute uh, magnitude, um, here's the nuclear luminosity when we measure that. So you can see these, these luminosities, this is in units of 10 to the 40. So this one's up to you know, 10 to the 41 here, um, 10 to the 38 here. I mean, these are, are, are relatively faint systems. Um, if you look at the, the nuclear emission to the Eddington um, luminosity, these all fall in the range, a couple as high as 10 to the minus 5. Uh, but mostly 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 9. Um, very much these, these low, very low Eddington ratios for these low luminosity AGN. Um, so we find at least about 80% um, get detected. Um, a few don't, but it's prime, you know, deeper observations again would probably detect most of those. Um, about 70% um, are detected as radio sources. Um, Helen Russell looked um, a couple years ago at the nuclear emission in, in cluster galaxies and, and found uh, some similar results there. Okay. So now I wanted to turn to um, elliptical galaxies. And uh, again, I'll show you some where feedback is working fine. And some where, um, in this, these cases, there's been way too much feedback going on. So here's, uh, here's 4636 again. Uh, and I'll show you some on each of these uh, M84. I won't show you more on this one. Um, what I want to tell you, it's one of the smallest cavities we've found. Um, it's only about a kiloparsec in radius, um, but has a definite hole in the middle of this one. This one also has a definite hole, but I can't show you in this picture. Okay. So here's 4636. Um, this has these, these arms on it are actually, this is an emission after you subtract a, a beta model, and these kind of outline you know, cavities here, this cavity here, um, another cavity here, um, that get made by um, the supermassive black hole. Um, you can take how much energy it takes to, to, to fill these, and you get plenty to overcome the cooling. Um, you see these are actually, these two arms, we can actually measure jumps across them, and they have their, they are weak shocks that produce these. Um, this is a typical elliptical galaxy um, that people used to think was gas-free. Okay, ah, I have more things here. So these, in terms of size, these arms here are eight kiloparsecs, so this is not looking you know, at something small and deep in the core. These are, are pretty big structures. Um, and here's the, the Mach number measured from watching the temperature and density jumps across these. Uh, it's about Mach 1.7. Um, it's happened, started about two million years ago, and the energy that's produced is 10 to the 56 ergs. Um, again, that, that nuclear emission compared to this is tiny. Um, we see a point source that might be the nucleus. Um, it's at about 1.6 times 10 to the 8, 38. Could also be a low mass X-ray binary, right? There are a lot of those in these, these galaxies. Um, so anyway, there's, there's almost no um, X-ray emission from the, from the central black hole itself. 
um, but it's doing a lot in terms of putting energy um, into the system. Um, here's another big bright Virgo elliptical. This is M84. Oops, is it going to come back? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, this is the, the huge elliptical. These are on the same scale. Um, there are, are cavities here, pretty complex ones. Um, the total energy here um, produced by the system is about 5 times 10 to the 55 Earths. Um, enough to, to move this gas um, out of the core. This is one of the, again, one of the tiniest um, AGN bubbles that's made. It's another Virgo galaxy, NGC 4552. I think some of you may know it as a radio source. Um, it has two very small bubbles here in this central region. Um, there's a, a 1.7 shock. And this is how much AGN energy is put out, a bit over 10 to the 55. And it's young, only about 1 to 2 million years old. You actually see that it's a higher temperature here, so we may actually be seeing the, the direct heating um, from the outburst. Now this is in Virgo, and it's moving. So here on a different scale, those, that, those outbursts I showed you are way down here in the core. Um, but I think you can see that it's got a, a long, hot gas tail behind it as it moves through the Virgo ICM. And that's been pushed back here and has sort of made the, these horns on the front of it. So it's not a, it's not a stationary galaxy um, in the middle of a group. Um, it's pretty much just <coughs> a, a, a one of the bright ellipticals in Virgo. Okay. <laughs> So this is some work that, that Paul Nelson um, did a couple years ago. Uh, we had picked out um, 27 groups and clusters um, that had cavities, about 30% of those in the sample. And this is the, the time of the outburst and how many cavities there were at different times. And here's the, the energy, um, 10 to the 55 to uh, so 10 to the 50, yeah, 10 to the 55 to 10 to the 59 herbs, how much energy is coming out. And that's, again, plenty of energy to heat the gas in all of these. Um, so here's, here's Paul's plot. Uh, we measure the, uh, the energy that comes out basically in uh, the pressure times the volume. This is the enthalpy. Um, and these lines are for um, different amounts of, of this, this thing called the pressure times the volume, the PV. And here's where um, all the galaxies are falling, all the various cavities and things. Cooling would dominate in this part, and, but up here where all of these are is where AGN dominate. Um, the time scales, again, are, are you know, a million to, to 100 million years with a peak of about um, 10 million. And you know, here's the energy, 10 to the 55 to 10 to the 59 verbs. Um, okay, so I told you cavities are common in these systems. We see them about 30% of the time. Um, if we had better data, and we'd probably see larger fractions. Um, we see a wide range. This is the, the X-ray luminosity. Um, plotted here, and this is the X-ray luminosity per unit um, optical or K-band luminosity. So this has kind of all been normalized down. Um, those low mass X-ray binaries that we can't resolve, they're contributing at this level. Um, the stars that we certainly can't resolve any of, they're contributing here. So these are all the nice, bright uh, ones that I've been showing you examples of. Um, and these are the ones where we're seeing about 30% Having, having cavities. Uh, we can measure AGN in, in a lot more of them. Um, we see a, a low set down here. Probably most of these are having galactic winds going on. Um, and I wanted to show you um, the next plot. Keep this in mind, this shape of where you're seeing um, LK plotted um, against here. Let me show you the plunk results. Okay, so here's Plunk paper 11, okay? So here again, stellar mass. Here's the plunk 
of detection, Y500, and they stacked 260,000 of the brightest galaxies from Sloan. Okay? And they're easily detecting these. And then someplace down here, um, they're probably not detecting them anymore. So these are all the ones, again, showing that overall there's gas in these systems. We see it in the X-ray. They see it in the SZ. Um, and someplace down here, it probably is forming a wind. So we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing these guys bright in X-rays, and then down here, you know, it gets to be really iffy whether there's really much gas around those. So we're trying now to probe. It'd be great to have higher resolution SZ and increased sensitivity to be able to probe this region and, and see if, if in here there's any, you know, qualitative change in the jet uh, low properties or the, the stellar mass of the hot coroni when it has vanished here. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you now about um, a, a couple of objects where um, there's way too much feedback going on. And those are um, Fornax A, which sits down here, and these two other galaxies labeled in, in red up here. So starting with um, Fornax A, um, here's what the X-rays looks like. It's quite faint down here compared to these other massive ones, um, but there's been a, a huge radio outburst here. And that radio outburst probably blew most of the gas, the hot gas that we see out of the system. There's a little bit left here, you know, kind of this core region has a little, but, but most of it has just missing from here. Um, yeah, so uh, Lorraine Lance did this work with us when she was a graduate student, and here's how much energy she um, computed for the outburst from Fornax A. So now I wanted to show you those other two red ones. I'll really show you the work on um, NGC 4342, um, which Akos Froden has done. And this galaxy, this is Virgo, uh, the nice Rosette image of, of Virgo um, that Hans Boringer made. And here's M87, okay? Uh, here's M86. Uh, here's a lot of these other guys I've been showing you. But this guy sits down here. He's very, he's very faint compared to the bright ones. And he's actually located in a group that's a couple megaparsecs behind Virgo. And if you look at the X-ray map of this region, which is here, and you compare it to the optical map, which is here, this is this, is this galaxy, 4342. He's the one that, that sits on here. There are quite a few other very similar looking galaxies um, in this little group behind Virgo. But 4342 is clearly special. He has a lot of gas, um, and to keep hot gas around the system, you have to have a dark matter halo. Okay? There's not enough stellar mass to bind it. None of these other guys have hot halos around them. Um, it's also, it's got this funny shape to it. That's because it's actually moving through the, the group medium that it's in, and it's being ram pressure stripped from it. Okay, so that we can measure the edge across here and determine how fast it's moving. But mostly what I want you to see is it's got a big halo of hot gas around it. It's got a big dark matter halo. It doesn't have many stars. Okay. So here, here's a plot of these. Um, here's on average, you know, if you plot the bulges of galaxies and um, you plot the mass of the supermassive black hole, um, these two fall way off of this. Everybody says bulges go in sync with, su with um, supermassive black hole mass. Not always. Most of the time, but not always. Okay. Um, when, after we found 4342, we actually scanned all of the Chandra observations and all of the X and M Newton observations that were in the archives, looking for more examples. Um, we only found the one. Either they're very rare, or we suspect nobody looks at these really low luminosity 
um, optical galaxies, they just don't end up being, being observed by these major observatories. Um, in these cases, the, the black holes are much too massive for their stellar bulges. Okay? They're in 4342, it's 60 times too massive, and 4291, it's about 13 times more than predicted. Well, how does this all happen? Presumably, if you don't form, you're not forming, you haven't formed the stars, you formed the black holes. So the way to make this happen is you form the black holes first. And they had a huge outburst in these systems and prevented further star formation from going on. Okay. Um, e Rosita will be great at uh, finding more of these because it'll scan the full sky. You won't have to wait for somebody to decide this not very interesting looking galaxy should be looked at. And there's no other way I know to find them. Okay, so um, to start to tell you what we've learned, um, the massive ones um, have hot halos around them. This is key to pack, pack, capturing feedback. It's a good balance. It's not always a perfect balance. I've shown you some cases where you've got the Phoenix cluster, you don't have enough feedback, you've got lots of stars being formed, um, and you've got these galaxies where um, there's too, too much feedback. They, their bulges didn't grow. Um, supermassive black hole outbursts are common. Um, it's primarily accretion going on that, that powers these. Um, the supermassive black hole plasmas outflow, they create bubbles, they drive shocks. Um, they're pretty common. The bubble energy produces about half of the total outburst energy. Um, some of the rest of that comes from shocks and other, other ways. Um, the outbursts last pretty long, about a million years. Um, usually not strong shocks. I told you they're all Mach 1 point something, right? So they're pretty weak shocks. Um, but there's plenty of energy here to reheat this um, radiatively cooling gas. So we're, we're finally now really, I think, beginning to see the unification of black holes, accretion modes, galaxy formation, and supermassive black hole coevolution or not. Um, as well as to understand the dichotomy between spirals and ellipticals. There's a really nice review um, that, that two of our participants have uh, recently written um, that uh, is from here. And I think I, I, somehow there's a W that got mistyped in there. It's a 2016 review. Um, so here a final bit of summary. Um, so most super black holes are getting the feedback just right. Okay. Um, over at least some you know, average duty cycle. They're keeping their host galaxies free of new star formation. Um, but there are these interesting failures that I've showed you in both directions. Um, these were getting too much feedback, probably early on. They lost their gas. Um, they can't make um, new stars. Uh, they have big black holes, uh, but they, they don't have enough stars. That's also probably what happened today in a systems like Born in XA. Then there are ones where you get too little feedback, where you, like the Phoenix cluster, there just isn't enough feedback to stop the huge amounts of star formation that's going on there. Um, we've had so far pretty small surveys to be able to find these, these unusual kinds of systems. Um, but Eosita will be providing a wealth of, of new data um, to find these optically faint, but really X-ray bright um, galaxies with the hot coroni where the AGN suppressed the star formation um, at early times. Um, so you all know, you know, why we care about feedback, and this is kind of my galaxy summary. Um, you know, it's, it's the supermassive black hole is generally tied pretty closely to the stellar mass. I've shown you the exceptions, um, but this is a natural product of the, the, the relation between the, the black holes. Um, and, of course, you need the feedback to not grow these supermassive galaxies. Because without it, they would, they would be much larger than they're observed to be. Um, and it also really tells us you know, how we're getting these, um, these elliptical galaxies 
versus the ones that are the spirals where you've still got lots of formation going on. You don't have, you have a little but not a lot of hot gas and you don't have very massive black holes usually at their centers. I want to just end by talking to you just to remind you there's a lot more wonderful missions in the x-rays that are on either the, the near or the far horizon. Um, and one of those is Irozita, uh, a Russian-German mission um, that will be, uh, that, that um, should, you know, detect all massive clusters in the universe um, and will provide a lot more information on defining scale relations and cosmological parameters. It'll spend four years mapping the sky and then followed hopefully by another three and a half years of pointed observations. Um, Athena has been um, approved as a European mission. Um, it has a two meter effective area. Um, Chandra has the effective area of a piece of paper, you know, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Two meters is big. This is good. Um, it won't quite, it doesn't have Chandra resolution, um, but it will be able to trace um, clusters and groups to a redshift of one and measure compositions of the hot gas. It's a very exciting instrument. Um, the US is, is beginning now to study um, a follow-on mission to Chandra uh, for the 2020 decadal called the X-ray Surveyor. And it will have 30 times Chandra's effective area uh, but maintain the one arc second um, spatial resolution over the full field of view. And it will be about Chandra-like cost, um, and it would be a very exciting mission. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the marvelous and expansive uh, review. Um, now we can take questions. So for the Phoenix cluster, it's located where the high red shift. At high red shift, yeah. point, point, point six, yeah, point yeah. five, yes. Yeah. So the high star formation rate may reflect uh, the evolution of the BCG. So uh, what, do we, what do I mean that uh, uh, at the high red shift, Phoenix star cluster may not be exceptional. So yeah. what do you think of that? So we, we have a fair number of other clusters that we, we know about at comparable red shifts. I don't remember CLO 16 plus 16, 3C295, um, and none of these look anything like the Phoenix cluster. Um, but again, you know, that one was found because it was picked out from the SPT SE survey as being a very massive cluster. Um, but the SE surveys, you know, scan 2,500 square degrees. Um, so again, it, there, there may well be more of these at those redshifts, um, but we haven't found them yet. So I think, so right now, it's, it's really the only one we know about at this kind of a, you know, 600 um, solar masses per year of actual star formation, and, and a coolant flow of nearly 3,000 solar masses a year. We don't know about anybody else like that. <laughs> So, so um, I was always puzzled by this sharp um, mark around one point something. So it's so it's not buoyant because it's it is supersonic. But if you if you put all the data together and plot it Mach number versus luminosity of the all energy of the bubbles, do you always see saturated around Mach one point something, or is there such a dependence on the Power. So the, 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 the bubbles are, are they're inflated, um, and, but they really are rising pretty gently. Um, I don't think we ever see, Eugene's here, Bill's here, I don't think we ever see any, any large mock numbers in terms of the, of the outbursts from the bubbles. We see, Bill's going to show you beautiful results on, on the, a huge shock in M87 that correlates with this and also gives you, you know, mock numbers. We do see big mock numbers when we have clusters merging. 
<laughs> yeah, but, but we don't see them in We've the got simulations like that. So the buoyantly rising, the Mach number doesn't rise up to be that high. So it's, it's slightly being driven, but I just never quite understood why it kind of stops at one Mach number or one point something. And one of the possibilities is be by the time we're capturing it at a large scale, it, they, they settle. Because I think Sydney had a Mach number much higher than that. Was it was it Taurus A or Sydney? Well, there's one that so the is shot. Same, but that, that bubble that was the picture of you at the beginning, it's got the jet going one way and it has that counter bubble on the other yeah. way. That had, there's a shot there, and, and we measure a Mach number for that, but, and it, it's somewhat bigger, but I don't remember the number in my head, but it's not, it's not a huge Mach number either. Okay. Lucas? Yeah, if, if uh, in relation bias if there is a dependence of the electron heating on the Mach number, for example. In one case, when we studied the shocks, we speculated on this, that uh, uh, we see in some uh, uh, heavier scales that there is some dependence of the electron heating efficiency on the Mach number. And um, it, very often, the, the Mach numbers are inferred from the temperatures here. Not always, but um, so in, in principle, that there may be some bias that the weaker shocks are there, but uh, um, the the, the fact that we're inferred from the um, from the temperatures are lower. I think. Maybe well, if, if if the shock is really, we tend to pick out the shocks. We start by looking for a density jump, and if the if the shock is weak enough, then we're not seeing the density jump. We won't identify it as a shock. But some of the from the temperature or not? Like in some cases. We don't know where to look when it's just from the temperature, and we usually don't have deep enough data to be able to get a fine enough temperature map to be able to, to, to say, oh, there's, there's a difference on this small scale. That, so we really need the edge from the, the surface brightness to be able to know where to look for the temperature jump. I'll go I have a comment and then a, a question. The comment is, uh, there's no doubt that the case for uh, radio mode feedback is very compelling in the most massive galaxies. Yeah. The case of this is a poster child, and you've shown it for some uh, big elliptical isolated ones and so on. My trouble, or my comment uh, in general, and I'd like to see your reaction, is that uh, this mode of uh, AGN feedback is invoked by the galaxy formation community to explain the entire red sequence. Yeah. And if the entire red sequence goes below L star, first of all, okay, um, include many isolated galaxies, and importantly, it even includes galaxies that have disks, we call them S zeros, yeah. which never have jets, okay? <laughs> large scale jets. They just never observe. We, we know this by problem. And so, so this is a, a big puzzle to me. And you have to conspire to produce a smooth, universal Schechter function, not just a, a few isolated galaxies. My question is here. The outburst generation you estimated to be a few million years. Do you have any estimates on the interval, the, the, the duty cycle, of the, the in between times? You know? um, we have intervals only in when we're looking at groups. So the one I showed you of, of 5813, um, that one, because we see the three sets of outbursts, you know, we, we know when each one started, and, and so we know on that one. Um, so are the galaxies? There are other galaxies that have real galaxies that have multiple outbursts. I'm trying to remember. Well, I think we're is multiple. Right. So, right. so my, my, my very brief question to that, which is fascinating, is why don't we ever see them when they're on in the optical? I mean, in between, presumably, it was because of some high accretion state. And the, those times are really short. <laughs> so yeah, where are they uh, in the local universe? Or even at low redshift. Well, the the on times in these systems may not be may not the, the bright AGN on time um, may not be that long. There are there. I mean, we always see very these very low luminosity AGN. You know that have those. You know, ten to the minus five to ten to the minus nine of Eddington, and so that's that's what we see. I'm trying to think if there are any that are. 
noticeably higher. My, can like I, getting I somewhere? Yeah, so, please. So, so in terms of the time scale, you can, you, you can do it in two ways. You can do it from multiple births, and there are many that have multiple cavity systems. And you can do it statistically from samples, which we've done. And what you find is that the, the uh, duty cycle is approximately the cooling time. It's less than the cooling time, which is what you need. So they repeat at that frequency. And as you go to more massive systems, the repeat time gets even more frequent. So they seem to be tuned to that. But I um, think you were saying, why don't we see a really bright AGN? But, but you wouldn't, because these are these are still um, strongly sub -Edmonton. They're below point. Even, even the most massive bursts that Christine showed there um, if you calculate the Eddington luminosity, it's still below 1%. So that so as you go to more and more massive bursts, you see brighter nuclei, but they're still faint compared to quasars. And it's simply because all the energy is coming out of mechanical form and not radiation. And on your, your former question, you asked about, about you know the um, matching the uh, luminosity function. I think the I, I think what Christine showed was you see these cavities all the way down to almost L star or a little bit above. And you see them in, in normal giant ellipticals and in, in over six orders of magnitude and luminosity. So you all go all the way down to the point where winds should take over for feedback. So there are some gaps, but it's not, um, you know, we, we need, you know, the details need to be filled in, but I think it looks pretty good. There's, there's also growing evidence that at least among the, um, the radio bright AGN, um, that, that we are seeing small X-ray halos around those. So there may be, there's cooling going on. Um, the trouble is they're distant. Um, typically people don't observe these for very long, uh, but, but we have ones, again, at red sort of like a half, where, where we're seeing small halos and, and there's enough to be, to feed those systems. And, and those have really bright radio AGN in them. Thanks, Christine. Yes. So I think uh, we'll move on to Eugene.